Well, hello and welcome YouTube. Mr. Robinson back here with yet another brand new exciting video. All math-based, of course, and as always, it is an honor and a privilege to be serving you today as you step inside my virtual classroom. Let's go ahead and learn something. Uh, today is going to be focusing on sequences. This is a brand new unit for my students, and this is probably going to be one of a three-parter on sequences. This first one, first two are kind of one the same as far as what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to use the function equations and either create sequences from the functions or write an equations based on the sequences. Today we're going to be using the equations that they give us and write out sequences as a result of it. A lot of function notation used in this one. They've done it with subscripts before. We're using f of n function notation. Um, I'll go ahead and show you kind of what they look like to start off with these few problems here. This is uh, f of 1, f of n, etc. So we're looking at that form. Hopefully you're okay with that because we just did functions very recently with my classes as well. Um, the third part is going to be using them in real life context. That's two videos down the road, so we're good there. Um, this is Halloween night, so I want to try and get this one cracked out of the way. And also, if you see behind me, this uh, 49ers Arizona Cardinals preview here, so I want to go ahead and watch that one too. Um, before I begin, though, let's go ahead and uh, let's address the white elephant in the room here. I closed my closet door. Yep. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Some of the questions I realized when I popped this one on, I, um, this isn't even the first question actually, but when I popped this one on, I noticed, I said, oh goodness me, look at this. I'm gonna have to use a calculator to take the square root of such a large number. I don't know what the square root of that number is. But let's go and get the first problems cracked out of the way if we can. Uh, numbers one and two, complete the table and state the domain and range for the sequence it represents. Assume that the sequence continues without end. The continues without end part, I think, has to do with the domain and range, which is totally fine. We can go ahead and use that. Um, prior to that, let's fill out this table. Now, this is going, um, if you don't know what a sequence is, a sequence is a list of numbers, and the numbers are actually these ones right here, the 15 and the 30, etc. going on to here. If I wrote this as an actual set, it'd be 15, comma, 30, comma, who knows, 60, comma, who knows, comma, 90, like that. These numbers up here represent the position that they are in. So this is position one, position two. These are not the values. These are implied in a list. So we'll always start at one. Uh, I mean, some sequences might start later, but this is the first position. There is no position zero physically or literally. There could be theoretically. And uh, there's no negative positions, no half Cs positions. So position one, two, three. Clearly, we're going to place a four here and a five and a six. Um, if you understand what is going on with this sequence here, or you have some sort of semblance, what you're looking to do is the sequence follows some form of a pattern. So when I'm looking at this here, there are two thoughts that come to mind for myself. I can either possibly be, maybe I'm adding 15 to all my values here. That's totally possible. Or maybe something like I'm multiplying by two each time, you know, something like that. Well, which one tends to actually be the case? 15 times two is 30, 15 plus 15 is 30. But when I multiply 30 by 2, I should be getting 60 here, and 60 times 2, I should be getting 120. But clearly, that's already 60 there. So the times 2 doesn't seem to be the way that I'm going to go here. Plus 15, does that work out? Plus 15 is 45. Plus 15 is 60. Yeah, it looks like we're going in that case uh, right here. So it looks like this sequence has a pattern. I'm adding 15 each time. So 45 is going to go there. Plus uh, 60 plus 15 gives me 75, and I am fulfilled. So that's the idea of sequences. This is their actual appearance here in table form. That works out too, but you're gonna start seeing me writing sequences or them writing sequences in other ways. Um, state the domain and range. Um, assume it continues without end. So for domain, assuming this pattern continues, this goes one, two, three, etc. I don't think I have to write four, five, six here. If I place a dot, 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 there I'm telling myself that it's gonna continue this trend. I need at least three numbers to write though. Because just like the last set, this could have been 15, 30, 60, or 15, 30, 45. We didn't know until we saw the third number or fourth number in some ways to confirm what it was actually going to be. Uh, the range as it so appears is 15, 30, 45. And like I said, at that point, I think I'm set as far as referring to what remains. Everything's adding to 15. This pattern clearly tells me that. I could list those, but because it continues without end, I know it just doesn't end here. It should keep going. There should be seven has 105, eight has 120, and so on and so forth. There's my, do uh, there's my domain and range for that one. Okay, number two, same set here. I'm just gonna go ahead and write it through. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then what happens here? 
it looks like you can already see the pattern six to eight to ten what i'm creating when i write this kind of plus two and show that two is adding on to these ones and i think you can agree with that is two represents in here what's called a common difference and a common difference occurs in sequences that are called arithmetic sequences okay now an arithmetic sequence is a sequence that contains a common difference the difference of two meaning that eight minus six is two 10 minus eight is two, et cetera. They don't always have to increase. They could decrease. So far, we haven't seen one. Um, I think the next sequence, which is not arithmetic, the square root one, it does decrease, but uh, we'll take a look at that when we're ready. And um, so that plus two kind of gives me that rule, gives me that idea, just letting you know in case we run into the term arithmetic sequence or in case they ask for common differences right here. Uh, the domain and range, same kind of thing as before. Domain, listen, the domain for sequences should not change as long as you're starting at one. It goes one, two, three, and continues on that path. Okay, that's the thing about sequences. You will not get different domains for these things. The range, of course, will change. This is your list of numbers, and this can continue on the path six, eight, 10, such that the common difference between every term is two. All right, so that's just the idea behind sequences, getting you it in a nutshell, building it up nice and slowly. The lists will not generally be written as tables, at least I won't write them that way, and, um, now we're going to be using, if you saw that number three, we're going to be using an equation to now build ourselves a list of a sequence, at least the first few terms here. All right, so write the first four, four terms of the sequence defined by the given rule. This is number six through eight, as you can see here, six through eight, three through eight, as you can see here. Uh, number three, what you have here, this is a sequence, well, this isn't the sequence right here. This is the first term. When they say f of one equals, if you recall, going back for a quick second. If n was one, here this is f of one equals six. That was six is the first term in the, um, in the sequence. So our first term I know is 65,536. I've taken care of one of the four terms that I need to get in the situation. Now there's a comma there, so uh, I'm gonna write a nice big comma here for my term because there's a comma for the thousands. My next term here, and I'm only going to do this thing once as far as calculations. Every other one I do from here on out on recursive, I will not because the work is kind of an overload. In fact, I'm going to erase what I write here so much so if that makes sense. I got to find the value of the second term. I got to find f of 2. Okay, Now that means my n value is 2 here. And in order to do it, the rule that they give us here is we're going to take the square root of what says f of n minus 1. If my n is 2 that's gonna be two minus one. Now this isn't a multiplication right here. They're not asking you to do f times two and f times one and distribute, nothing like that, no. This is the function. The function has this rule. The rule is the next term is going to be the square root of the term before it. Look at that. f of two equals the square root of f of one. Okay, f of one is 65,536. So f of two is the square root of 65,536. All right, now what is that? I don't know. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go to my graphing calculator here and I'm gonna punch that thing in to figure out what it is. So the square root, let's see, we need the square root of 65,536. Hopefully it's a whole number, it is 256. And good thing too, because I know the whole number, uh, I know the square root of that one leading into the rest of the way. So um, that is 256. And that's what f of two becomes, 256. That is the value of the second term. What you uh, just did here, this is called a recursive. I'm gonna write it in in a second. This is called a recursive sequence or a recursive um, rule for the um, sequence going on here, the square root sequence. To find out the next value, I'm going to take the value before it and do something with it. Now I'm gonna do this over and over for the number of terms that they ask me to do. And the way that you can recognize that something's recursive is if it says, to find this function, I'm going to use, uh, to, find, to find the function of blah, 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 I'm gonna take the function of blah, blah, blah right here. Most rules that you'll see, oh, these are almost all recursive here, this one's not. No, they're not, about half of them are. <laughs> That's fine, okay. So 256, so I'm gonna add that to my list. That's okay. Uh, 200. And 56 is the next one. The next one that I do, what I have to do is I want to take the square root of 256. F of 3 is the square root of F of 2. So square root of 256 is 16. So 16 is my third term. 
and the value of the fourth term is the square root of 16. See, so you're taking the square root of the value before it, and that's going to be 4. So my first four terms are listed like that. That is my sequence as the first four terms. Obviously, this could continue infinitely, but the numbers kind of get too small to the point that it probably wouldn't be worth it at some point. All right, number four, f of n equals n cubed minus 1. So while these ones, and I'll go ahead and uh, write this all out in full, all of these three right here, these are recursive rules, meaning you depend on the value before it to get your next value. The ones over here, these three are called explicit. These are called explicit functions, which you can see the difference in the equation, not the square root versus cubed portion, but the fact that they don't have an f of n thing over here. They just have n. n, as you saw before, was the term or position number. Just the number, just the first term, blankety, but the second term. The ones that you can't see in the actual list itself. Um, now, the domain is always 1, 2, 3, etc. if I want to start a sequence that way. So if I'm going to start my sequence here with the first term, I'm going to go ahead and take f of 1 first. And the way that an explicit rule works is I actually use my term position number, the 1, to calculate my value. So I'm going to do 1 cubed which is 1, minus 1, which is 0. So the first term in my list is 0. Now, I'm not going to use 0 to get my next value here. I'm going to use 2 to get my next value. If f of 1 is 1 cubed minus 1, f of 2 is 2 cubed minus 1. 2 cubed is 8, and 8 minus 1 is 7. So my second term is 7. So as you can see here, you're substituting something in this time uh, to officially make it count. And then you're getting the value back out. And I'm going to just continue it for two more. Uh, f of 3 is 3 cubed minus 1, which is 27 minus 1, which is 26. That's my third term. And my fourth term is f of 4 equals 4 cubed minus 1, which is 64 minus 1, which is 63. So there are the first four terms in that list right there. So there's explicit and there's recursive. And I, it looks like I'm going to swap back and forth between explicit and recursive the rest of the way here. So again, those first four terms depended on, whoops, depended on the term value, uh, excuse me, the term position and not the previous value that we had, unlike the recursive ones here. Okay, number five, it's back to a recursive one. And notice what's different also about the explicit versus the recursives. I had to find the first term for the explicit, but I knew that I had to find the first term first. In other words, I had to substitute f of one. And here, they have to give me the first term because they're gonna tell me what I'm gonna do for the term following. But I need to have the preceding term to figure out what it is first. So when we write out the first four terms in this sense here with number five, I have to know what the first term is in order to continue what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to start with 7 as my first term here. The value of the first term is 7. The next term that I get is I'm going to take basically the previous term. In this case, it's going to be a 7. It's going to multiply by negative 4, which is negative 28, plus 15 gives me negative 13. So that's the value of my next term. I took 7, the previous term, multiplied it by negative 4, and added 15. And I can write it that way, or write all those steps, or do it mentally. This is what I might do in my class. Take this value now, multiply it by negative 4, and add 15. Negative 13 times negative 4 is, I think, 52. I don't want to be wrong. It's 52. Plus 15 is 67. This is a really strange rule when it comes to, could you figure out what's happening on your own? Highly doubtful. Could I? I'll be honest, highly doubtful. There are some things in this that make this significantly more difficult. Um, I'd have to go under the pretense that 7 was generated at random, and the other ones came as a result of doing something. All right, the last term. i got to take 67 times negative 4 again, plus 15. Um, I know this, but uh, two, negative 272, negative, two, seven, negative 268. This is bad. I think negative 268 plus 15 is negative 253. I really should confirm that. I feel bad if this is wrong. That's right. That's got to be right. Negative 253. So those are my four terms in that sequence there. I have the calculator. I really should just go to it. Interesting that this sequence actually oscillated the pattern, and it looks like that negative 4 had quite a lot to do with what happened there. 
All right, number six, explicit function again, f of n equals 2n squared plus 4. I'm going to kind of write them out on the side to start with, just like f of 1 equals, because I want to make sure that you note what happens with order of operations here. Um, 2 times 1 quantity squared plus 4. I don't do 2 times 1 first and then square it. I do 1 squared first and then multiply that by 2. So 1 squared is 1. 2 times 1 plus 4, that's going to give you 6. So my first term in my list is 6. And of course, I had to choose 1 first, and I'm going to choose three, uh, 2 and 3 and 4. Whoa. Equals, equals, equals. <laughs> okay. So my first one is 6. Second one, 2 times 2 quantity squared plus 4. 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8. Again, make sure that you avoid doing 2 times 2 first and then squaring it. That'll give you a different answer. 8 plus 4 is 12. Um f of 3, we'll get 2 times 3, quantity squared plus 4. 3 squared is 9, 2 times 9 is 18, plus 4 is 22. And then the fourth term, 2 times 4, quantity squared, that's 16 times 2, which is 32, plus 4 is 36. So we get 36 right there. Those are the four terms in that sequence. I think I am set to go. Now, as you can tell, um, none of these have had a common difference. I used the phrase arithmetic sequence before. None of these here are arithmetic sequences. These have all been different. This is a quadratic sequence just by rule. Some of these have, this is a square root sequence, you know, so a cubic. So all these have different things in mind. Just stick to what you know. All right, last recursive one right here. We start with the first term that they give us, three. I need three more terms after that. And it looks like what we're going to do is take the previous term the square brackets also just mean parentheses. I'm going to take the previous term and I'm going to square it. it. Seems simple enough as far as the idea. And again, that's what that says. To take the value of one term, excuse me, to get the value of one term, take the value of the term before it and square it. So what do I get? 3 squared is 9. 9 squared is 81. And 81 squared, I'm going to do this without the calculator. 6400. <laughs> I'm focusing on you, 6480. 6561 is 6561 right there. So those are the four terms of that, the first four terms of that sequence. And the last one, an explicit function. We are going to be doing f of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Evaluate them. Let's see if we can kind of do this mentally this time. Substitute 1 in for n. 2 times 1 is 2. Minus 1 is 1. 2, uh, 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 squared is 1 f of 2, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3, squared is 9. f of 3, 2 times 3 is 6, minus 1 is 5, squared is 25. And you know what, based on this pattern, I'm wondering, this is 1 squared and 3 squared and 5 squared. I'm going to guess the next one is 49. I, I mean, there's, there's something to it that obviously makes that happen, um, because that's the number that we're squaring. <laughs> Uh, f of 4, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 1 is 7, 7 squared is 49. So that's where we get that one too. If you ever pick up on a pattern after three of them, see if you can get the next one based on it. It's kind of fun to do. Some people might say something like this. Oh, this is plus 8, and this is plus 16, which is 8 more than 16. So maybe this is plus 24, because that's 8 more. In this case, you'd be right. But maybe it's also plus 32 because that's double and double. So it all depends. A lot of different things you can play with. Of course, use the explicit function to make sure you're not wrong. That's numbers um, 3 through 8. Okay, find the 10th term of the sequence defined by the given rule. So, uh, oh, great. They're, they're showing me something that I was just going to talk about. 10th uh, term. The 10th term requires that you, if you have a recursive function probably spell out the first nine terms to make it work, which isn't terrible based on the uh, sequence that you're doing or based on the rule here. So this one, the first term is two, okay? And in using two, in doing two, I can use that to get the next value. The next value is the value before plus seven. So plus seven, we get nine. That's the second term. The third term plus seven is 16, okay? 23 is the fourth term. The fifth term is 30. 37, 44, 51, 58. I believe that's the ninth term, yes. And the tenth term is then 65. So f of 10 
equals 65. That's what we found, the value of the 10th term in the sequence. Okay, So we use the first term to recursively then determine what it was. And not that it took a long time, because there wasn't much computation to do, but it took a lot of numbers to figure out what it was. In a recursive function, sometimes that's a required thing you're going to have to make happen. An explicit function, who, who is that man? Sorry, I just saw a weird shot in my, um, in my shot. An explicit function is kind of neater for not going for one term at a time like this, but for finding any particular value, any imaginable value that you want. If I want to find the 10th term, guess what? n represents the term number. And guess what what? I get to substitute 10 in for n in my equation. So in this case, f of 10 equals the square root of 10 plus 2. Not the cleanest number in the world, and I don't know if they want me to approximate or do what with this. This is the square root of 12. <laughs> um, if you're in Algebra 1, you probably, I, I, this is probably fine. If you want to round it, go ahead. It's going to be 3 point something. My guess is around the 3.5 range. Um, if you knew how to simplify radicals, this would give you um, 2 root 3, like that. If you don't know what that is, don't write that down. But this is 2 times the square root of 3. If you don't know how he got that, don't write that down. I'm just saying this is a particular way of getting that one. But yes, substituting 10 in for this got me it automatically. It's a direct computation. I don't have to figure out what f of 9 is. and do that figure out what f of 8 is, and so on and so forth to make that happen. All right, find the 10th term of this sequence here. This one looks a little more robust. I got to double my number, double my number, and then subtract 50. And I'm starting from 30, which is quite large. But as you can tell, we're doubling, uh, we're subtracting 50 from our large number. So our first term, whoopsie, our first term is 30. The next value, I'm going to double it. I'll just write this down below for a second. I'm going to double it, uh, the 30, and subtract 50 from there, which is 60 minus 50, which is 10. So 10, let's switch colors up in this problem. So 10 is going to be the second term there. Maybe it'll shrink from here on out. What do you say? What do you think? I don't know. Maybe it'll literally shrink to the point it goes negative. What if I double 10? That's 20 minus 50 is negative 30. Yeah, so we're going to negative territory. Ooh, it's going to get large. Uh-oh, because I double a negative and subtract. Let's hope I can do this with the cal uh, without the calculator here. Double thir negative 30, I get negative 60. Minus 50 is negative 110. If you're confused what I'm doing, again, taking this number, times 2, minus 50. Oh, boy. Negative 110 times 2 is negative um, 220. Excuse me. Minus 50 is negative 270. That's only the fifth term. We have to do this five more times to get the tenth term. I'll let you know, there are ways that you can work around this, but it requires you finding out what the explicit formula is. And it's not always a nifty one to take care of. I'm not keen on doing that at this very moment in time, especially when there are two things involved here. Uh, negative 270 times 2 is negative 540 minus 50 is negative 590. Negative 590 times 2 is negative 1180. Minus 50 is negative 1230. Negative 12, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3 more. Negative 1230 times 2 is negative 2460. Minus 50 is negative 25, goodness gracious, negative 2510. The problems I choose for myself to do. Um, and remember, this is all to find the 10th term. Um, negative 25, 10 times 2 is negative, here, let me write it, negative 5,020 minus 50 is negative 5,070. And one more, whoops, not negative 570. And one more, uh, negative 5,070 times 2 is negative 10,140 minus 50 is negative 10,190. I might have made a mistake there somewhere. I don't know. I intend on that being the correct answer. It's not really about what the answer is, though. It's about what I had to do to accomplish it. I was multiplying my numbers by 2, and then I was subtracting 50. Okay, That's what the rule is telling you. So if I did things correctly, f of 10 is negative 10,190. And this one I'll feel a lot happier about here. Um, 
even though it's going to lend to a fraction. That's, that's okay. Uh, f of 10, I can substitute this one straight in. Okay, so this is going to be uh, half of 10 minus 1 plus 3, which is half of 9 plus 3. Half of 9, you can put 9 over 2. I'm going to put 4.5. Generally, I don't say things in terms of decimals. In this case, because it's an exact one, I can. 7.5 is an answer. Or, or if you wanted to, you could say something like 15 over 2. If you wanted to go in that fraction route, either would be accepted. That's going to be f of 10, remember? f of 10 equals that. So there you go. Now, again, if you're confused on the recur re excuse me, the recursive versus the explicit, why I'm not substituting f of 10 straight in here, let me call attention to it really briefly so you can take note of what would happen. If I did f of 10 here immediately, yes, 10 would go in for n over here, because you're like, wait, 10 went in for n on the other one. There's an n here. Why doesn't 10 go in there? Well, be alert as to what happens. This is 2 times f of 9 minus 50. Now, imagine... At the time, we did not know what f of 9 was, the value of the ninth term. Pretend like you didn't know that. Okay, so we got to find the ninth term. To do that, we got to find the eighth term, and got to find the seventh term, and the sixth term, 5, 4, 3, 2, and we have the first term. That's why I needed to get the second term, so I could get the third and the fourth and so on. If I don't have f of 9, I can't do anything with that. Here, I don't need f of 9. Here, I just need the value, uh, excuse me, I just need the position number to actually get my answer. So explicit and recursive both have their benefits. I say recursive is about finding terms in succession, one after the other. This is about finding any particular value that you want. This one is, uh, although less readable, is something that you generally seek in patterns uh, with your head on your own. And I say that as most every student I've ever met would do that first. Even I probably would seek that first. Uh, explicit is something that you've done a lot in math anyway, straight substitution and evaluating. Okay, eight more problems. The explicit rule, so here's explicit, this means we substitute in for whatever. Explicit rule for a sequence and one of the specific terms is given. That, that means they're referring to the value. Um, find the position of the given term. So the specific term, the value, they gave us f of n for something. They gave us what the actual value is. We need to find out what term has this value, okay? This one's kind of neat because it's basically algebra. I'm gonna substitute f of n is 25. The value of some term is 25. We gotta find out which term it is. We gotta find out the specific, excuse me, the position of said term, like the fourth term, things like that. Okay, so what do I do? Substitute. If f of n is 25, 25 takes place of f of n. Which n gives us this particular f of n value. Okay, that's what we're looking for. So straight algebra with this, like I said, I'm gonna subtract 6.25 from both sides here. Let's try and go calculator free. Here's the good news about these. Your n value is never supposed to, it's, it's never going to be, so if you get it wrong, you know that's, that's something we'll check out. It's never going to be a fraction or a decimal or a negative. It is always going to be a positive integer. n has to be a term. 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. That's the good news. So um, not only are your computations good, but if you screw up, you'll know about it. Uh, this is going to be 1875. That equals 1.25 times n. Divide both sides by 1.25. Off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm going to play with this a little bit. Um, $1.25 times 4 is $5. So $5, $10 is 8 of those n's. $15 is 12 of them. Second, one, two, three, so 12, so 15, n equals 15. How did I do that? Use a calculator. I talked about money. So, um, oh, you know what I could have done? Um, another dollar 25 that would have gotten me to, to $20, and I could have subtracted one. Okay, that was that one. So again, substitute, 25 takes place of f of n. Number 14, I'm just gonna continue the same thing. Negative 51 is one of the terms in this explicit form right here. Let's go ahead and figure out what that is. Negative 51 just so happens to equal negative 3 times the quantity n minus 1. You have two options in what you can do here. It's, it's kind of your choice. I can either distribute the negative 3, and I'll show you both. I can either distribute the negative 3 into both terms here to make this say negative 51 equals negative 3n plus 3. Keep in mind that'll be a plus 3. I'll subtract 3 from both sides. I'll just stick to the color. 
Subtract 3 from both sides, I get negative 54 equals negative 3n. Divide by negative 3, and I get n equals positive. Remember, it's got to be a positive, 18. And again, what this means is that the 18th term, the 18th term has a value of negative 51 in this particular ex, uh, explicit um, sequ um, sequence. Okay. The other way I could have done this one, I'll do it in green here, is instead of, instead of distributing the negative 3, I could have divided both sides by negative 3. Because remember, negative 3 is multiplying by this quantity here. And the good news is, like I said, things are going to appear as integers for us. Negative 51 happens to divide by negative 3. Gets you, I think, uh, 17. So 17 equals, all that's left here now is n minus 1. Add 1 to both sides, n equals 18. So you might look at this and go, huh, that was easy. But it requires you recognizing that you can do that not only as, a, as an aspect of multiplication here, but also that it actually divides plainly, and you have to know how to divide that. It was still a kind of big number, but then again, so was this. So, All right, so you get n equals 18 one way or the other. I'm um, going to move this over to the side a little bit. I'm going to go ahead on to number 15. Let's go a little more over, please. Thank you. Number 15, f of n equals 2n minus 2 in the quantity plus 2. Any substitute 52. Um, I don't know what they're going for with this. I'm going to clean this up a little bit. See how we distributed here? I could have started with that. Just like here, nothing to distribute. This is 2n minus 2 plus 2. Why are the parentheses there? Maybe to confuse you, but you don't need them. And negative 2 plus 2 is 0, so all you're left with is 2n here. So f of n is 52. Which term has a value of 52? Divide both sides by 2. And we're going to go ahead and get n equals 26. The 26th term is 52. And if you follow the rule here, 2n, the first term is 2, the second term is 4, 6, 8. You keep going up by 2s. So the 26th term gives us 52, and that's the end result. All right, five more problems. The recursive rule for a sequence is given, and one of the specific terms is given. Find the position of the given term. So the same kind of thing, only now using recursion. Now using that, find the value, use the value of the next term to find your next value. We're going to keep going until we land on our per, uh, on our particular number. Okay, so let's go ahead with the uh, idea here. They give us the first value. The first uh, value is eight and a half. I don't like mixed numbers because I don't use them anymore, but um, I, I like this rule enough to say I think this is going to be just fine. Okay, so the rule says to find the value of the next term, you take the value of the term before and you subtract one half. So what's eight and a half minus one half? Well, that's eight. Eight minus a half is seven and a half. Now notice, we're gonna keep going until we find five and a half. Obviously, we're gonna find five and a half. The question is, which term has five and a half as a value? Subtract, you get seven, just keep going here. Six and a half, six, and five and a half. So essentially, what I gotta do here is I stop, and I go ahead and I count it out. This is the first term and the second, et cetera. So which value for n provides you this thing? Looks like it's the seventh term. Which position is it? It's the seventh position or seventh term that has a value of five and a half. So that's using recursion to go ahead and iterate through there until you get that particular one. Number 17, following the same thing here, f of one equals 99. I think I know this, I, I'm gonna guess six already, um, by seeing the difference here. There are, by the way, there's more than one way to get these answers, but this is the iterative process that you're practicing recursion along the way to make it happen. There are a lot of other mathematical ways, but this for sure practices the sequences that you are honed in on. So the first term is 99. It looks like the rule says take the previous value and add four. We're gonna keep doing this until we land on 119 as our value. So the first term is 99, add four. The second term is 103, add four. The third term is 107. Add 4, we get 111. Add 4, we get 115. Add 4, we get 119. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The sixth term there, whoopsie, excuse me. The sixth term right there, n equals 6, will become our position that has that value. Now, I want to restate here. Someone might ask, what if you add 4 so much that you skip over it? What if it was 117 and then you add 4 and you got 121? Well, it won't happen. So either, you, either they wrote the problem wrong or you miscalculated. Um, it won't happen. 
you're expected to land on that number. See, you won't say if you got 117 and then 121, you won't say, oh, it's term number 6.5. There is no term number 6.5. You jump from 117 to 121. These functions are discrete. They are not continuous. Okay. Last one here, number 18. And then I think we have some kind of word problems that we graph or situations that we graph. Uh, F of 1 equals 33.3. F of n equals, uh, you take the, to get the next value from the first term, we take that term and we will add 0 0.2. We'll do this until we get 34.9. So bear with me here. Add 2, add 2, and so on and so forth. 0.7, this is 33.9. Now we need to get up to 34.9. So 34.1, 34.3, 34.3. 34 Sounds like a radio station, only you don't hit that FM frequency. 34.9. So which value was that? Let's count it out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the eighth term is 34.9. N equals 8. We are set and good to go. All right. Okay, number 19. There's two more problems, numbers 19 and 20. In both of these here, we are just, we're going to model this thing. And it's a good thing I just talked about discrete functions before because now we're getting into the sense that, all right, well, if it's discrete, that means we don't con uh, we don't connect the graph. It's not continuous. So number 19, graph the sequence that represents the situation on a coordinate plane. Jessica had $150 in her savings account after her first week of work. She then started adding $35 each week to her account for the next five weeks. The savings account balance can be represented by a sequence. We can write out the sequence to start. I think that'll help you get the understanding of what's happening, but they also model this for you. The weeks are the X's, or the ends, if you will, and the um, amount, the account balance is the Y or the F of N, if you will. So the position number, remember your domain. Your domain for these things, guys, is one, two, three, et cetera, and they model it as such. Whoopsie. They model it as such. They said $150 in her savings after her first week. See, generally when we do word problems, we're so used to saying the starting value, like on week number zero, there is no week number zero in sequences. We don't model week number zero. This after the first week, that's week number one. So week number one, she has $150. That is plotted right here. Week number one, she has 150. So remember that. Um, so f of one, in that case, is 150. When x is one, y is 150. That's another way you can write it. But we can write this out as a list as well. She adds $35 each week. So what happens here? Plus 35, she gets $185. And then plus 35, how many weeks? Next, The next five weeks, not through five weeks. So we got to do this five times. One, two more, um, plus 35 is uh, 220. Plus 35, we get 230, uh, 255, excuse me. Plus 35, we get 290. And one more time, plus 35, we get 325. There we go. So 150 is one of them. Then 185, eh, this is going to be kind of hard to work out. It's kind of halfway, but a little closer to 200 right there. I'm going to plot that one. 220. If this is 250, 220, I'd say, it's, yeah, kind of messed that up. Remember, 225 would be halfway. So 220, okay, right there. And then 290, excuse me, two, yeah, 220, 255, excuse me. That's really close to 250 right there. 290 is getting pretty close to uh, 300 there. And then 325 is right halfway in between, smack dab between 300 and 350, so like that. So it should be linear as far as the uh, constant growth goes. This was an arithmetic sequence, if you think about it that way. I will not, I will not connect these right here because that's indicating a couple things. Uh, it's indicating it's not a sequence. And also in this thing for Jessica, that's indicating that she is getting a constant flow of money being added to her, her account each week even if she was it looks like she's only tracking it each week um the the balance maybe she goes in there can i get my balance it's that after the end of week two things like that so that's the graph there's the representation i am set uh the next one is gonna have the same instruction i believe i didn't have this instruction on here but graph the sequence that represents the situation all right carrie borrowed 840 dollars from a friend to pay for a car repair carrie promises to repay her friend in equal monthly payments so again, she's paying at the month. The remaining amount Carrie has to repay can be represented by a sequence. So again, keep in mind, she borrows $840. 
and she promises to repair uh, to repay her in equal monthly payments so you know this is interesting to make mention of here because i'm curious to see how this one goes it's set up for a sequence however hmm the months that go by remember what i just said there is no hey, look 840 may be the first term in the sequence to you let's let's write some numbers out to start okay she promises to repay her friend in eight equal monthly payments. That means that the rest of the way here, throughout these next eight months, she needs to get down to zero dollars and zero cents. So what do we have to do? We have to take this 840 and we have to divvy it up eight different times. That way, each time I subtract that amount, I can then get it all the way down. So that's 105 each time. What does that mean? That means each time I'm going to be subtracting $105 from the amount. Now keep in mind, 840 was how much she borrowed. After you take away 105, she will now have owed only $735. Now I'm gonna keep subtracting 105 here. Basically, subtract the hundreds place and then subtract a five from this number. So 6, 30, 5, 25. It's pretty simple. 4, 20, 3, 15. 2, 10, 105, and of course, 0. All right. Now, 0 is the eighth month for which that thing occurs. Remember, she, she borrowed 840 from the beginning. So, month number 1 is here. Now, this is important to talk about when it comes to sequences. It can be represented by a sequence. 840 might have been her starting amount. But this is after month number one, and sequences start. This is the weird part that I'm kind of contemplating back and forth. Sequences start from the first, first value. And the first value here is represented by month number one. When n, or x is one, is when we start. So month number one is here. I 840 is not a part of my set as far as I'm concerned. This is me looking at this for the first time and making this mention. Okay, and I'm wrapping this up. This is the last problem here. So these are months one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I already plotted eight because that was a simple one. But I'm not going to plot the 840, even though loan balance is there. That's how much she borrowed. And then she pays 105 after month number one. And then it kind of goes, you know, it goes in from there. So, uh, and let's see, kickoff is happening behind me. So let's go ahead and finish this one. 735, here's 700. And then 35 thereafter. Oh, you know, here. Okay, I think that's a different color, that's okay. Uh, 630, again, O, right, you know, here. Uh, all these are gonna be just above the line a little bit, and they're gonna get closer and closer to the line. So I don't love the scale. Look at that return from that, that must be a cardinal. Um, 525, so 520, okay, 525 should be a quarter of the way. I'm gonna go ahead and scale these ones, plot these ones a little higher up there. A little. I think 35 is a lot closer to 50 than it is to the other end. I'm being picky, but you know what? I should be. One fifth of the way up, four, do do do. Getting, you know, getting closer basically. A little bit at a time until you get down to the very bottom right there. Sure, that works. And again, I didn't plot 840. No, that one's not being considered, and you don't connect the dots. I hope that last one that I said was right in the sense that I'm trying to follow the sequence pattern. Sure, 840 must be how much she started off with when she borrowed, therefore she owned that much, she owed that much, but represented as a sequence. Who is that? Represented represented as a sequence, you have to keep in mind what's going on there as well. You start with n equals one. Your domain starts with n equals one. All right, so that's going to wrap it up there. I'm at my minute number 44. I'm done here. This is Mr. Robinson signing off. Thank you for entering my virtual classroom. Happy Halloween. I'm sure you're seeing it after that, but happy Halloween. Go Niners. And uh, I'll see you later with some more sequence talk. Next time, we're going to be building equations based on the sequences with explicit rule and recursive rule. I believe those are going to be the only ones there. They're going to be, I hope, only for arithmetic sequences. But thank you. Enjoy your evening.